is uh, great to be joined by Juan Thibault uh, Giblin. Um, he is a visiting fellow at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium based in Budapest, Hungary. He wrote a book on the current prime minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban. Um, the French title translates to, uh, I hope I get this right, uh, Why Viktor Orban Plays and Wins. Pourquoi Victor Orban joue et gagne? How are you today, people? Thank you for joining the show. Yeah, thank you very much for your invitation. Um, indeed, uh, so I discovered Hungary for a few years uh, in 2012 when I was a student. And uh, after I decided to orient my, my career in European affairs. Mm -hmm. And we should understand that uh, for from a central European point of view, um, the Carolingian area, so this central, this core of the European Union, based on France, Germany, and the Benelux, is the most important place, is the reference. And the same from uh, Western Europe, we do not understand very well what does mean Central Europe. So in Brussels, I've, I was working in the European Parliament during a few years, and I understood that, according to my opinion, uh, the most valuable, the most insightful proposal for European politics came from Central Europe, mm -hmm. namely from Hungary. So I decided to write a book to explain to French readers what does happen in, the, in Central Europe why Hungary is proposing another path uh, for European unity and European politics. And I decided uh, to write this book precisely after the uh, victory of Fidesz uh, in legislative election in 2018. So uh, now the book was translated in, in Hungarian in 2022. And my, my wish is to create bridges in Europe, between Central Europe and Western Europe, because we share the same civilization, but we are less and less able to understand each other. And to me, it's because of a certain um, autism, a certain obsession of the West, uh, thinking that it is a universal pattern that no one can avoid on Earth. And of course, that the smaller countries of Central Europe should follow necessarily. And, and yeah, here we are now. And I, I think that for the last couple of years, the original proposal from Hungary showed that there is an interesting and insightful uh, uh, path for the other European countries, including the large one like France and Germany. <laughs> I see. So, um... According to your research, how will you chart um, Viktor Orban's uh, rise to power? Um, so how I understand it or how I would describe it? Um, describe and then understanding, yes. Okay, okay. So what we should understand first is that Viktor Orban came from the countryside. He is uh, uh, a street fighter of the, this, this dissidence in, in the, the, the social and he was refusing the foreign domination over Hungary, even beyond that, the question of the ideology, the socialist ideology. Um, and during the 80s, so he was a student in Budapest, uh, that was an interesting time to resist because socialism was weaker and weaker. So there was a room of maneuver to, to propose an alternative. The easier way was to claim that you want to join the West. You want to copy this consumer society and the, the prosperity of, of, of the West. But it was the, the very first step just to, to, to have an alternative. But Hungary has a long history, variable cultural references. So the, the, in, during the year... Uh, 1989, when the Iron Cartoon fell, Victor Orban became very famous because he did a speech uh, on Hershak Tere on the, the uh, Euro Square in Budapest, and he claimed for the, the, the departure of the, of the Red Army from Hungary. So 
First, he was the leader of a young party, the Fides, uh, founded in uh, 1988. And he was in the opposition during eight years, mm -hmm. during two terms. And he became a, a prime minister, was elected as a majority in the election in 1998. So during this period of time, Victor Orban had a genuine fascination for the West. And he wanted to implement successfully what's happened in the West in Hungary. And he had a very bad experience. At the end of the four years of this term, he lost the election because he was superficially uh, at power. He had the electoral institutions, but he didn't have the deep state. He didn't have the media uh, uh, support to comment in a positive way what he was achieving. And he had more eight years in the opposition. And this is why um, during this time in the opposition, he decided to reconsider how we should organize the power. He decided to uh, propose an alternative to the Western general pattern. And what is interesting for the second time in history is that Viktor Orban was a lucky player in history. Because if he, did, he, he was fighting the communist system at the very end of the communist system, and so he could uh, uh, see the success um, during his youth, he was successful to see the fragilization, the failure of the American globalist system from 2008. So from the, the, the famous financial crisis that started with the, uh, the subprime crisis. And so if the West, the Anglo-Saxon West, namely, was not able to propose the political reference, it means that you can propose something else. This is exactly what China, what um, Russia, what the BRICS generally try to, to, to implement today. And Hungary, and Hungary at its scale, which is a, a, a local scale with a locked country in the, in the European continent, try to propose a national Hungarian way to solve the global problem of our time. This is the situation. And in 2010, um, Orban Victor won with a landslide victory. We had the two thirds of the parliament, and he could propose and make adopted a new constitution the day of Easter 2011. And with this new constitutional organization, he could develop an ambitious political family. Uh, he could uh, uh, try at least, and this, there is first progress in that sense, to solve the question of demography, not by the, 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 the generalization of the migration as a change of population, but the, uh, the, the defense of the Hungarian families in order they can have large uh, um, number of children and that the nation could renew itself. Uh, there is interesting uh, effort as well uh, for in the domain of the justice. The justice uh, was an institution in the head of the former communist elite. And the former elite was not necessarily communist in mind, but they were very uh, open to serve global agenda. The global agenda came from Moscow before the, uh, 1989 and after from Washington. Uh, there was as well an effort to defend the media sphere that could balance the oligarchist domination of the foreign owned media. There was a try to uh, attract the foreign investment and use the European structural fund to create an industrial basis in Hungary. And to that regard, it's very interesting to observe that since the, um, the, 
joining of the European Union in 2004, uh, Hungary and Central Europe as well developed skyrocketly their uh, industry. In the same time, uh, France, Italy, and Spain lost a lot of their industrial potential. So there is there is an economic policy that works in that sense. And finally, there is in the public speeches, in the uh, political debate, a strong will to defend the nation as the community of reference and to defend the national way of doing the fact that Hungary should come first. And in a very interesting manner, uh, when Donald Trump said, let's put America first, Vito Orban defended that, okay, we have kind of similar agenda. Let's defend our home first, not in the sense of hostility uh, to the others, but just charity, well organized, uh, put your country first. And we we could say that even if Orban and, and Hungary is isolated in Europe today, they join a kind of general trend elsewhere in the world. I see. Right. So much of what I hear from Viktor Orban comes from either Americans who do not like him, who sees him as a concerning presence, and other Americans who see him as the greatest leader that Europe has right now. And I think they are divided on the question of um, how Orban puts um, national identity and nationalism at the front of it. And I guess if you read someone like um, Jürgen Habermas, you would say that we need to progress past the nation state and towards this thing called post-national citizenship. That's why he welcomes and embraces the European Union. But um, how would Orban defend the uh, importance of uh, the nation state and how and why should he we defend it against, I guess, the concept of post-nationalism? So there is several uh, answers. One is uh, first because it works. It works better. Um, that's not enough, but this is a first interesting step. Um, the, 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 the reason why the Brexit was successful was because um, the public opinion in the UK thought, okay, the EU system is not well organized to defend our uh, success as, uh, as a market, as a country, etc. But we can observe that after a few years of Brexit, the same policy is implemented. So if it's only the question of who is the most uh, talented uh, uh, level to implement globalism, um, the question is very poor. Uh, and, and Hungary tried to go beyond that question. Uh, the question is not uh, that we should rely on nation state to implement globalism. But unfortunately, this is some uh, um, some claims of uh, French sovereignists. That for some French sovereignists, they say that France is a global nation. Uh, it's multiracial. It's multicultural, but we should decide from everything in Paris. So there is France and the world, and they'd say the United Nations. Um, this approach is dysfunctional, and it's because Orban does not fall in that trap that he's successful. Because the question is not only how we could play in the international market, in the international economic competition, it's what do we are? And we are a people, we are a nation, we are a family. We came from the eternity where uh, our Hungarian ancestors were striving and fighting in the steppe. We came in that land 
we built a nation state and we want to maintain our heritage, our legacy, and give this country to our children. This is the national philosophy at the core of, of uh, let's say, the, the, the specificity of Hungarian politics. And according to this logic, Hungary is very uh, um, uh, keen on European idea because Hungary is part of European civilization. And to defend Europe, it's not to defend the, um, the legal institutions organized since uh, the end of the Second World War. It's to continue European civilization made on the specificity of these people uh, who look like each other, mainly when you look at from China or other corner of the world, and who have a, a specific spiritual legacy built on the legacy of the Greece, of Rome, of Christianity. Um, and because of this understanding of identity, Hungary is able to respect the other. They know that they have a specific mm -hmm. language, and so they they have a, um, a, a pragmatic friendship with the Turkish consuls. And they know that all the people have a legal right to exist and to uh, continue to exist over centuries on their historical land. That's why. Victor Orban, even if he is a proud European, he defends the uh, the sovereignty of Turkey today and call it a strategic partner for the world Europe. Mm -hmm. That's why, um, as much as possible, he has friendly and at least positive and pragmatic relations both with Iran and with Israel. And um, the the. The key to understand this uh, mindset is how Hungarians um, consider themselves. And this is what I told you first, that they are a family of families. They are a nation. They are a um, collective being that uh, live over centuries through, uh, through generations. I see. Well, um... Uh, I would assume that uh, you you write the book for a French audience, given that the book is in the French language. And I wonder if um, within uh, French politics, the debate surrounding Viktor Orban is uh, the same way as in America, where one side views him as you know, as a concerning presence and the other is you know, a good thing that happens. Yes, yeah, somehow there is this aspect. Unfortunately, the, the, there is not a lot of strong political personality uh, today in Europe. So you easily reach the, the, this kind of manichaeism, either you like it or you dislike it. But uh, the difference with uh, the US, that the common belonging to the EU. And even if uh, Emmanuel Macron has not specific political affinities with Viktor Orban, they are partner in the European Council, and they have some common interests. They want to defend both of them, uh, a kind of strategic autonomy of the European continent. They want to defend the nuclear energy, uh, and, and that to that extent, they are united against the German green agenda. Uh, they have uh, some industrial common uh, uh, interest, and they have the, the the defense policy and the industry of defense, which has some some good uh, good connections. So, pragmatism mitigates the ideological conflict, and this is for me the main difference with the U.S. I see. All right. So, um, of course, after 1989, uh, uh, mainstream Western politics proclaimed the. Um, the end of history, obviously, the <clears throat> the victory of liberal democracy as a domestic political regime and global free trade as an international program. But as you mentioned, the 2008 recession <clears throat> um, put that end of history well, to an end. And, and we see uh, while the West was uh, 
falling apart economically. Uh, countries such as China is rising in power. So um, uh, I guess um, the the symbol of, I guess, uh, global free trade and liberal democracy, um, as described in the end of history, is the European Union or the EU. And Orban is described as a as an Eurosceptic. So with that in mind, um, is, is it the case that uh, he became a Eurosceptic after 2008, or has he always harbored you know, a skepticism towards the Union? Oh, no, no, uh, Victor Orban would like to, to love and to defend the EU um, as it was in 2004. You know that the Hungary joined the EU in 2004 when Orban was in the opposition. But most of the job to implement all the, the requirement to enter the EU was achieved during the, 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 the first term of Viktor Orban from uh, 1998 to 2002. Um, at that time, it was there was no alternative for that. Uh, and the, that was the EU before the Treaty of Lisbon, of Lisboa. The, the, the current uh, um, institutional organization. It was before this try to implement a treaty, a constitution for the European Union, uh, which failed because of the referendum, uh, the, the, the fail of the referendum in France in 2005. So we were just before this post-democratic evolution. And moreover, all this question of the rule of law, this LGBTQ agenda, this uh, uh, um, mandatory migration uh, quotas were not at stake at that time. So it's kind of innovations that came in the European debates after the, the, the time when the, the Central Europe joined the EU. And another interesting point is that the Article 2 which is the most controversial article because it, it were uh, that's the article where um, the values of the EU are uh, quoted. But this is a very abstractive way of uh, considering uh, that equality, respect of the other. That's important. This is a very simple expression, and everyone agree on that. And Hungary um, continue to assume that. They defend this uh, uh, this mandatory aspect of the of the European the treaty. The problem the problem is the interpretation of the text and the fact that based on the respect of equality, for instance, you have this uh, uh, mandatory LGBTQ agenda, even if. Uh, there is absolutely no clear consequence that equality should be implemented in that way. And indeed, all the social or societal agenda, it's not part of the competences of the EU. It's part of the competence of the nation state. Uh, so the, the Hungary is extremely disappointed because they try to defend the EU as it was set up and organized at the turn of the millennium and they just don't they don't they just refuse this evolution that dismantle the, uh, the the EU as an organization of nation states equal by right and to 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 implement a kind of United States of Europe mm -hmm. All right so uh, I'd like to examine I guess uh claims about uh, Viktor Orban being an authoritarian, as I've heard from, I guess, people of the mainstream Western media. Um, um, so, of course, uh, two um, telltale signs of, say, whether a leader is authoritarian is that um, they uh, do not have a viable opposition, and two, uh, the media is unfree and, you know, not allowed to criticize him. So, is it the case in Hungary that Orban has a viable opposition and the press is free enough to criticize it? Oh, the, the political debate in Hungary is completely free. Um, you, just contrary to France, 
which is the case I know the best with Hungary, uh, contrary to France, when where oligarchy own all the media outlets. And if it's not the media, it's the of course the public media completely in the networks of what we call the the, the central uh, parties. Um, Hungary has a re real diversity. This is a brutal and sharp opposition. There is strong fights between different medias uh, with different interpretation of the fact. But Hungarians can enjoy all the possible uh, viewpoints on the in, in the society. There is discrepancies according to the different uh, kind of media. For instance, uh, the internet media, it's much more liberal on the left side uh, because maybe the most active part of the population in that media, this is the young urban uh, uh, population, and they are more connected and they are more liberal. And if you look at the, the, the daily uh, newspaper in the countryside, it's almost uh, a part of the um, pro-government media outlets. So um, the, the elder people who have a, um, just a connection with the information with the, the newspaper, the local newspaper, will have a, a bigger focus on a, on a conservative or at least pro-governmental uh, consideration on the, what, what happened the day before. But if you are on internet, that would be rather the other side, the river one. So, and, and that may explain the uh, the shift between the population in the population, the fact that the other past or uh, all the part of the population vote massively in favor of of uh, uh, the prime minister party, the Fidesz, and among the young and urban voters, you have a majority for the liberal opposition. Maybe this phenomenon could have a, a kind of um, of a logic evolution. Uh, but we should, uh, there is two interesting observations on that reality. First, um, in the last election, 2022, most of the cities, um, and, and to be honest, all the cities in Hungary voted for Fidesz, except two city centers, in uh, Pech and Seged and, and Budapest. So the young people, and, and even in Budapest, the, the, the vote for the Fidesz was very important. It's not, it's not an exception, like it's an, an exception to vote in Paris for the right-wing populists. It's very low, it's like 5%. In Fidesz, it could be between 30 and 40%. Uh, and second interesting consideration, there is a kind of parallel between Emmanuel Macron and Viktor Orban uh, regarding the vote of the elderly people. The, the, the retired people vote massively for uh, Emmanuel Macron in France. And this is a reason of his success because uh, it's 17 millions of um, uh, retired person uh, in France. So in Hungary, this is the, the old people. It's now a kind of comfortable, um, kind of comfortable ref, uh, score for for Viktor Orbán parties. But um, this is maybe as well a question of generation. The the people who voted Fidesz at the age of 25, 30 years old, uh, 30 years ago, they are now much older, of course, and maybe that they follow the evolution of Victor Orban was as well maybe a kind of generational phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I see. All right. So um, there are obviously claims that he is a an illiberal. And if you follow classical liberalism, um, the state has little to no role in public affairs, uh, save for safeguarding the rule of law. So, you know, let the market decide what they want. Let civil society uh, adopt whatever value they, they want. Um, but you mentioned the um, LGBTQ plus agenda that comes from uh, obviously America and Western Europe and Orban as the leader is pushing back against that. Therefore he has to use state power. So that is, that is why 
uh, Western commentators who oppose him say that criticize him for adding in a clause in the Constitution, which says marriage is between a man and a woman. But of course, uh, the um, those who love Orban would say that he is pushing back against radical um, LGBTQ, especially trans ideology. So where do you stand on uh, this question? So, yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question. The point is that uh, Victor Orban has uh, a completely different point of view on the question of the state, because he considered that uh, the state should represent the permanent interest of the nation. So it cannot be neutral. Uh, and when it comes for, for the protection of children, it's impossible to, 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 to be to value neutral. Uh, this understanding of politics is already sensible, visible uh, back in 2008. It's precisely because the finance uh, uh, should be independent and that the market will um, organize the society in the best way that we were confronted to the crisis, uh, the sub uh, subprime crisis and the, uh, the, the, the crisis of 2008. So the approach of uh, uh, the Hungarian prime minister was uh, considering this evolution, will Hungary survive in the 21st century? And the answer was no. So you, you, you have to intervene as a political leadership to, uh, to, to reorganize this economic, uh, um, this economic um, dominated uh, society, but on a very strategic approach. The question is not to, to make, uh, to install a kind of communism, <laughs> the fact that the economy should be decided by uh, administrators. Is that it's just that there is a common good, there is a people, and the common good should be implemented for the interest of the people. So um, regarding the uh, the the question of, of work, uh, the fact is that Hungary work much more now than uh, 15 years ago. Um, there is almost no unemployment now, and the the, the rule to get your uh, unemployment, uh, pension, health, or, or uh, any uh, social protection, um, it, it's possible only if you are, you work before, if you are available for working, you even could um, you you should work for your local. Uh, uh, for your municipality, for your your city, uh, to to maintain your uh, social health if you are unemployed for too long. So this is what uh, the Fidesz call um, not the welfare society, but the welfare society. The fact that uh, if you want to, the, you need the, the 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 help of the state of the public organization. You need to help yourself, and you need to help the society. So, the the contestation of a too brutal uh, neoliberal approach was not to cover economic reality by a kind of protection, welfare for everyone, as the it's the case, for instance, in the the, the socialist uh, mentality in France. The the approach is rather where is the fair balance? And um, all that uh, vision is based on a moral, uh, sorry, on a moral vision of politics. And after its uh, political victory in 2018, Victor Orban had a, a, an interesting speech in Touche Banyoche. So it's a speech addressed every year in Romania. In, 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 in July. And he say that with such large victory, so the legislative election 2018, um, Fidesz has the legitimacy to build another era, a new era. 
And this era is based on a, a philosophical approach of life. And the fact that we should defend um, a, a, a real social justice. And it's not based on uh, this universal salary, like just mm -hmm. providing house to eat for someone even without any work this is terrible for the for the, the human dignity to have this approach you have to work but you have to protect the families you have to protect the people who help themselves and the state is an institution that cannot be neutral when it comes for the interest the strategic interest of the nation and the protection of the most vulnerable. Right. So I would like to mention uh, one of uh, your, uh, as in France's greatest leaders, uh, President Charles de Gaulle. Um, as far as I can tell, um, de Gaulle's economic policy is what you call de regis, which is opposite of uh, laissez-faire. Laissez-faire means a completely free market economy, and de regis means you embrace capitalism, but the state gets to decide the economic policy. So... I suppose Orban uh, follows the same economic nationalist model. So how would you, how would you, uh, I guess, answer to the criticism that, well, that is a very easy road to protectionism, uh, which is obviously discredited long ago? Um, of course, that uh, protectionism, uh, you should first answer, what do you want to protect? Is it the strategic interest of the nations? So okay, uh, you can you can uh, claim and implement such a protectionism. What we have today is rather a protectionism, very well accepted, promoted, and implemented by the globalist elite. What is the the protectionism of the large investors, the the, the will to secure the, the the investments and to guarantee the net income of the, uh, the, 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 the big international companies. So Victor Orban tried not only to protect, but to, to expand Hungarian economy. And it's not, the parallel is not possible with the Friends of the Goal, because the Friends of the Goal was a prominent player at the global level. It was a large, large economy, the French of the 60s. Um, with, I mean, in the, uh, strong navy, uh, with the nuclear uh, energy, with a uh, significant proportion in the global trade. That's not the case for Hungary. And even France had the engineer to be at the, 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 the top of the innovation, um, or at least in the leading group. And Hungary has nothing as such. So what they can do is just to take advantage to every interesting dynamic in the world. And it's what they called connectivity, that they, they and they, they oppose connectivity to decoupalism. The fact that um, we should stop our economical relation as well with Russia, tomorrow with China, uh, because of kind of mandatory uh, supranational orientation. Um, Hungary tried to attract the investment of South Korea, of China, in order to have a kind of industrial diversity in the investors and do not rely only on Germany, which is the by far the first economical partner of, of Hungary. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this approach, um, it, it's a, it's an audacious challenge. It's a bold challenge because you open your country to foreign investors. The you will have the salaries of the workers that would be paid, but you do not own the uh, the industry itself. Um, just Hungary has no sufficient uh, capital to launch this investment itself. And uh, there is no global uh, economical player from Hungary that could promote uh, innovation like in the battery. Uh, if we take the example 
of the, the, the recent investors uh, that came to Hungary. So Hungary is just trying to ride the tiger, trying to take the advantage of everything that could bring some investment, some job, some added value in the country. This is the, the very specific kind of protectionism that Hungary is doing. And to that extent, um, Gaul had a larger uh, uh, room of maneuver considering the economic policy. Okay. So uh, you mentioned the phrase, uh, the rule of law before, and obviously Hungary has been flagged by Brussels for several rule of law violations. And of course, um, the phrase rule of law is a very liberal idea, as in classical liberalism. The law, it stands uh, to like temper the passions of various factions and even like maybe even the will of the people as a whole. But uh, I guess this uh, conflict between Hungary and the EU so it shows that there's a tension right now between liberalism and democracy, the the will of the people versus the rule of law as the European Union defines it. So um, can you provide provide us more detail about this uh, current like rule of law conflict that uh, Hungary is facing? This, this is one of the most uh, brutal antagonism that we have today in Europe uh, because these two sides of the question used to be connected. Um, democracy uh, and rule of law, <clears throat> liberalism, uh, were, were associated in the same system. And we, we have this collapse of the former model and on the ruins of that model, uh, different tendencies try to attract the full legitimacy for them. And what is um, the too much for the leader of the global economy? This is the, the, the will of the people that they should accept and implement. Now, we, it's uh, similarly to the, this popular democracy of the socialist time. Uh, they, they claim to be popular democracies, but, the, but it, that was not the, the will of the population that was implemented, but the strict will of the Communist Party. Uh, and at the head of the Comintern, you had the, the Communist Party uh, in Moscow <laughs> that decided for everyone. So you, you celebrate the workers, but the worker has no power. And this, this is a bit the same today when you celebrate the, the youth, but the youth is extremely vulnerable today. And uh, there is less power and influence for the youth than ever in history. We are in a generation uh, today that will uh, have an access to the, the, the responsibilities in the 70s, the 80s, and they still keep most of the influence, most of the, the, the capitals, most of the uh, all the, the tool of power. So the example of the competition between Biden and Trump is very interesting to that regard. We, we have uh, a celebration of a class or part of a population which precisely has no influence at all. We uh, exert the power on their name. This is the same with all this um, verbal celebration of uh, Black Americans, but at a time when the precariousness of this population is, is huge and dramatic. Um, and today, we the, the extension of this weakness and this inability to choose for your own destiny is the case for the, the silent majority. Uh, what we, we, we named the, the somewhere, the people based somewhere, that they, they, they have only their corner of land and their local references. They cannot be successful like the anywheres, um, traveling to a, a, a working place to another and enduring the globalization. So this uh, weak and silent majority um, is under the attack 
of a wealthy minority, what we call the secession of the elites. And this, uh, in, in this situation, Hungary is structurally on the side of what we call the silent majority because they came too late in the arena, in the game. Um, in Hungary, even the wealthy class is a kind of Western middle class. They, do, they are not part of the winner of the globalization. Um, they, have, they can enjoy kind of visibility because they are at the top of the administration or at the top of um, some large companies. But the, the point is that they consider themselves that they belong to the people. And they do not belong that much to this uh, well, uh, wealthy um, uh, global elite. So Hungary is, to that reason, the kind of uh, the, 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 the voice of the voiceless. Uh, they, uh, they, and they, they try to defend the right of the silent majority based on the formal compromise, the fact that democracy should defend the majority. And in the other side of this competition, the globalists say, oh, but the majority is dangerous. Uh, the people cannot have a clear understanding of what we should do. And because the majority is less and less um, open to, to vote and to elect the representative of this wealthy minority, we, we, we have this um, bypassing policies of the, the, the classical political life. For instance, the COVID uh, crisis, during the COVID crisis, very brutal laws and regulations were implemented. The, the, and the, the, the democratic system had no clear voice in this, uh, uh, in this new, um, let's say, in this new um, political organization. It was the voice of these experts of the supranational organizations. Um, and here again, Hungary try to represent the voice of the silent majority. So, and so to, to conclude, it, it seems to me that um, this conflict is now uh, reaching an interesting, an interesting point because even among this wealthy majority, you have a multipolarity that appear on the globe. And the, the 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 wealthy elites in Russia are definitely not the same interest as the one in the US. And China is considering itself as um, maybe a major player that could be independent from the Western global orientation. So with this fragmented um, political elite at the global level, it's possible for Hungary to defend its interests um, in this, this the, in new in a new situation. I suppose that um, the difference, I think, between Central European nations, um, Czech, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland, and Western Europe, is that while they are um, both part of the uh, Western civilization, um, Central Europe had the brutal experience of living under the auspices of the Soviet Union on the less fun side of the Iron Curtain, so to speak. In fact, obviously, Hungarians still remember what happened in 1956, where their efforts at national self-determination was crushed by Khrushchev and Moscow and tanks. So Orban obviously was a grew up in that context, and he was a young man when he saw communism fell. So what are some of the insights and lessons that he learned having faced live under communism that I guess Western Europeans have not um, understood yet. The first one is that history is never over. 
Um, precisely the, 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 the claim, the revelation of this, the end of the Cold War was that this is the end of history and the, 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 all this, this Fukushima perspective, uh, Fukuyama, sorry, uh, perspective. But the experiences of Vito Orban and generally Central Europe is more richer and more interesting than these Cold War uh, references. We should understand Central Europe not only as the part of Europe were on uh, under the domination of the USSR uh, after the Second World War. This region um, was fighting to resist against the assimilation into an empire far before the uh, the twentieth century. For Hungary, uh, this is the domination of the Ottoman Empire that ruled the country from the Battle of Mohach in 1526 uh, until the end of the, of the 17th century. And during the, uh, we should understand that before, Hungary was a major European power. It was uh, one of the big states of the Christianity. And even they resisted uh, successfully during decades against the Ottoman Empire. And when they failed, they were uh, divided between between a uh, so large party under the Ottoman rule and the, the Austrian, so German domination on the, on the north western part. And it's not only the case for Hungary. For Czech Republic, so what we used to call Bohemia Moravia uh, before, the 20th century, um, it was a very strong kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire. And due to internal fights, uh, conflict of religions, and they, they fall under the domination of the Habsburg dynasty um, in 1620. And from that time, they had to resist the assimilation in the German uh, in a German power, and this is the same the case as well for Poland. Poland was even a very powerful country and a very large one until uh, the, the 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 18th century, and after they were divided and occupied, dismantled by Prussia, Russia, and uh, Austria, and. These people, so Czech, Hungarian, and Poland, Polish, uh, Poles, they um, they know that a state is not necessarily the representative of the common good. The state could be a foreign domination upon your people, and so if the definition. So uh, we are always talking about the, the historical background of Central yes. Europe. Yes. Um, and its um, ability to understand the challenge of our time. But the fundamental legacy of this difficult uh, past is that um, they, the, these Central European countries could understand the state as a foreign uh, institution. Um, and today, in France, for instance, we have a confusion. The fact that the, uh, with these nation states, we finally admit that the state is the people speaking and acting. But it can be a kind of artificial partnership. And um, if you look at the, 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 the world map, number of the official nation states has not this long history of building an institution that is in charge of representing and implementing the, the public will, the public interest. So um, in, in Hungary, particularly, the state during centuries was either the Istanbul, so the capital city of the Ottoman Empire, or Vienna, the capital city of the Habsburg Empire. And 
there was a political elite in the country. It was the nobility. There was no civil right, political right for everyone in the country. It was not this egalitarianism of the modern era, but the aristocracy um, successfully did their uh, function to defend the historical right of the Hungarian nation. So they were not a state in the sense, in the modern sense of the world, but they were the political body that represents the people. And they were fighting a state based in Vienna and before in Constantinople. And today this is the same, exactly the same, what continue to represent the political will of Hungarian nation. This is the national states based in Hungary, but they have to challenge a very strong supranational influence, mainly based in Brussels. But we could say that the most, the, the, the essential origin of its power came from Washington. And there is, of course, as well, strong power from, from, from uh, Berlin, a significant power from Paris, or at least an influence from Paris. And what is maybe decisive and very new and specific for our era, the own weight of uh, large corporations. When, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the Hungarian-German partnership is based on industrial partnership. And if Viktor Orban refused the, uh, the, the, this quota of migrants, maybe that politically Germany is firmly against this approach, but the automobile constructors like Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen uh, could advocate for Hungary at the EU level and uh, to, to the, the political German power saying, we do not need a conflict with Hungary. We have decisive interests, economical interests due to our factories based in Hungary. So we should find a fair deal. And, and this is something interesting. And the, the, the fact that finally, even what we what we, we see, we consider the power based in the state, but maybe that the economical power is so decisive today that we should take into consideration the power of large companies. I see. Well, uh, I think on that note is uh, a good time to end. Thank you very much, Thibaut Giblin of the Matthias Corvinus Collegium for joining the show. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be your guest. Au revoir. Thank you again. Okay.